Hello and welcome back to the channel. I hope that you're having a fantastic day. This channel and playlist is a, a collection of videos where we discuss and analyze the various general conference addresses. And if I were to ask you what's most important in your life, what would you say? Now, this is exactly what I've done before where I ask a question where the answer is so obvious, you know, it's showing up on the screen. Well, you know, I think the most important thing is to love thy neighbor. So if it's, it's really a lesson for those who teach lessons, whether it's in Sunday school or Relay Society or Elders Quorum or and, and anywhere else. If you're going to ask a question, make sure you don't give them your answer in advance. Just let them talk. What kinds of things do you think about most of the day? What kinds of things do you stress out the most about? What gets most of your time and your attention? You know, those those would be some good questions before, um, you know, kind of saying, well, the real answer is loving thy neighbor. <laughs> you know, So at least that's one of the answers, isn't it? So here are some possible questions to consider. What does loving our neighbor look like in real life and application today? We might even want to think about the good Samaritans in our lives. Who are they? Who were they? Why, why were they so meaningful to us? How often does our compassion move us to help others in need? You know, there's a lot of times where we we care about people, but it doesn't always translate into action. And similar to before, what is most important in our lives? And, you know, rather than thinking, well, what's the right answer? What's the answer that I have to give in church? What is it? How would we normally answer that question? If, if you catch me on a Wednesday afternoon at 6 p.m., what do I feel is most important in life at that time, right? So what is it? What what are the things that I'm focusing on, and what kinds of things might I want to focus on? When I listen to this general conference address, I my my first reaction was that I just really appreciate learning about other cultures outside of my own. I I just think that it's so important that we. The, that we recognize that not everyone is in the same situation. And better than that, that there might be opportunities for us to, to help other people who are in less fortunate situations. I'm also grateful, you know, that the church does a good job of not tooting its own horn, if you want to say that, in my opinion, anyways. And, uh, but at the same time, it's good to hear the good that the church provides to others. I mean, we we feel like we're a part of it. We feel like we've actually done something good if those funds come from our tithing, for example, or fast offerings. Another thing is that a lot of times, I'm just going to be honest here, a lot of times I'm focusing on me. What is it that I need? The areas that I'm trying to improve, trying to get by, trying to get ahead. You know, where I'm I'm looking at me and these kinds of talks are good reminders to me that I need to look outside of myself more than I'm currently doing. And the other thing too is just, oh man, the... If you've ever been around people who are so destitute, people who are really struggling, and it might be with physical needs or emotional needs or spiritual needs, I mean, you, you almost have to be a robot. I mean, you have, to, you have to be completely uncaring for it not to move you. It just, it just has to impact you in, in some way. And so my heart always breaks when I... I'm, you know, when I when I see or when I hear about suffering, I just, I, I don't know. It just, uh, maybe I'm uh, like emotionally sympathetic. I, I, I draw on emotions very, very quickly. 
So here's some quick background. Uh, speaking of background, what happened to the background on the slide? I have no idea. I'm sorry about that. Uh, Elder Arden talks about uh, a trip that he and others from the church took as a part of a church humanitarian effort. I don't think that should necessarily be capitalized, but anyways, to, to Africa. And he, he was talking about how he was humbled by the people's circumstances. Uh, and yet there was still some hope. And he said, as heart-wrenching as it was to see malnourished children and the effects of tuberculosis, malaria, and incessant diarrhea, there came to each of us an increase of hope for a better tomorrow for those we met. Now, these are, these are things that most of us are unlikely to see, let alone see on a, you know, on, on a grand or a large, large scale. And, uh, you know, certainly our, our hearts and, uh, you know, hopefully our prayers and even our funds go to help people like that in this situation. And it reminds me, too, between this particular talk and uh, a talk by Elder Uchtdorf entitled, We Are His Hands, that, yes, the Lord can just wipe out poverty, wipe out sickness, wipe out disease, wipe out injustice. He's, I mean, he has the power. But we are, at, we are often asked to be his hands. In other words, he has placed each of us upon the earth knowing what good that we can provide to others who are suffering. And he expects us to do so. The General Conference talk also um, talked a little bit about the Good Samaritan. And so at this time, we can just do a quick review of that. Maybe if you're teaching a class, you could ask someone to kind of kind of summarize it. But in the parable that Jesus was telling, a traveler fell among thieves, and uh, was beaten, uh, was stripped of his clothing, and was left for dead. There were there were those who passed him by, and we don't know exactly why, but it does kind of imply some different things that maybe culture and tradition was a part of it. You know, maybe maybe seeing this man who was who was beaten. Um, if you remember when. Jesus and the disciples saw a blind man, and the disciples said, Who sent this man or his parents that he, he should be born blind? You know, he, that he should be born blind, right? Like, it was supposed to happen, just let us know why. You know, what, what he must have done something to deserve it. And so in that, in that culture, there was really this kind of traditional viewpoint that if someone was suffering, it must have been because of something that they did wrong. And, uh, you know, maybe maybe kind of like in King Benjamin's address, we, we all kind of think that of people who are perhaps less fortunate than us. And we think, well, you know, we got to this with hard work. And if they, if they wouldn't have just made all those stupid mistakes or did those wrong things, then maybe they'd get to that point too. So I think that culture and that tradition is still alive in our society today, and, and perhaps even more so in some situations. You know, we also talk about stranger danger. There's there there was there was a kind of a different mentality or attitude. You know, there was this doctrine or a principle in the Jewish culture that if if a stranger needed help, that you helped. But at the same time, there was kind of this this idea that wait a minute, we don't even know where he's been. He could, he could make us unclean, <laughs> you know. Um, well, we'd really like to help him, but, um, you know, we've, we've, got, we've got some other things to do. We need to, we need to provide service in the church. We need to do our ministering. You know, obviously I'm, I'm uh, extrapolating more, more recent ideas there. But a Samaritan, someone who was an enemy to the Jews, actually ended up taking care of of this man in the story who had been beaten and robbed. And so we might ask ourselves, as Jesus was asked, who is my neighbor? And uh, that's that's what prompted this, this parable that Jesus told. 
but it's something that I think we could really again ask ourselves: who who is our neighbor, and you know, do they need to live next door? I think another question that we don't really talk about very often, but really connects to this general conference address, is also asking ourselves this question of who needs me to be the good Samaritan. Um, I said neighbor, but I guess I'm thinking just being neighborly. And instead of being that good Samaritan for them, I'm passing them by. And uh, so it's really, you know, two different perspectives to, to think about. And, and I think it'd be great if we try to put ourselves in the shoes of each of the characters in, in this parable to see what we can learn from that parable and that experience. Elder Ardern continues, despite our every effort, you and I won't heal everyone. You know, some, sometimes we, we um, avoid helping people because we just feel like there's, it's too big of a problem and or that whatever we do would, would not even make a difference. But as Elder Ardern continues, he says, each of us can be the one who can make a difference for good in the life of someone. And I, I certainly believe that. I believe that God has given us each gifts specifically to help other people and often in a very unique way. It was just one lad, a mere boy, who offered the five loaves and two fishes that fed the 5,000. We may ask of our offering, as Andrew the disciple did of the loaves and fishes, what are they among so many? I assure you, it is sufficient to give or to do what you're able, and then to allow Jesus to, or Christ to magnify your effort. I think that's a great, great, uh, I mean, one of the best miracles possible. I remember that Elder Holland was, was um, you know, really interpreting and examining why this miracle happened. And there's a lot of Christian scholars out there who, who believe that miracles, you know, as, as compassionate as Jesus was, the primary purpose of miracles was to establish his kingdom uh, upon the earth. And I, I mean, the way that I'm reading the scripture, I would certainly uh, agree with that. So what was the purpose of feeding the 5,000? Well, certainly it was feeding people, but then a little bit later on, he said, hey, you're, you're following me just for the food. So it wasn't just about the food. What, what was it? According to Elder Holland, he said that the primary message of that was that God's power and mercy is infinite. It will never run out. And that no matter how small or meager our talents or abilities God can magnify them. I mean, can can you imagine if the lad came in and he says, you know what? I only have four loaves and one fish. I mean, can you imagine Jesus saying, Oh, if I just if I just had one more loaf and one more fish, then maybe I could feed the five thousand, but you know what? Just kind of like a get smart quote and just missed it by that much, right? Just, just missed it. So close. If, if, if you had that talent, if you had that ability, if you had that popularity, if you had that money, if you had that house, if you had that family, oh man, if you just had all those things and I could use you as an instrument to do good and helping other people, but oh, so close, so close. You just, you just missed it. You just missed the cutoff. I was, I was passing out powers and opportunities to help other people. And, ah, oh, you just, I mean, just look at the clock, you know, or just, you're, you're just a little too late. And I, I think sometimes we, obviously I'm being sarcastic, but I think sometimes we, we look at ourselves and we underestimate the, the qualifications that the Lord gives us when we're willing to serve. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland also stated rich or poor to do what we can when others are in need. He then testified, as I do, that God will help you and guide you in your compassionate act of discipleship. He continues in his lesson. This is uh, Elder uh, Arden. Um, 
apologize if I'm mispronouncing that. He says, we are equally grateful for your two pence or two euros, two pesos or two shillings. They're easing the burden that too many around the world are having to bear. It is unlikely you know the recipients of your time, dollars, and dimes, but compassion does not require us to know them. It only requires us to love them. There have been a few times in my life where, um, you know, whether it's the church or sometimes random people who have provided food, who have provided money, um, you know, those those kinds of things have meant the world to me that, not not only not only what they provided, but what what it meant to me, that it it meant to me that I was not hidden from God. Um, a, a little while ago, we moved to a new place, and it was a very stressful time in our life because we knew that we we're supposed to move, but at the same time, I knew that I was giving up my employment, and my employment was very secure. I mean, I I. Uh, you know, I wasn't I wasn't loaded with money, but at the same time, it was going to provide a very secure retirement. And um, you know, moving early or moving away from that really cut off those funds and uh, led to me having to let go of of that job. And so stressful one day, you know, just pouring my my heart out to God. And it was very interesting because. During during this time, I got this very strong impression that says, go outside now, and very much of an emphasis on the word now. And so I went outside. I can't remember if I was in my pajamas or sweats or what it was, but I just, I just went outside, and I just stayed out there for a minute waiting for an answer. And, you know, there was a couple of cars that went by, and then I went back into the house, and... Um, very shortly after that, we we had a visit from someone, and uh, they they provided the money that we needed to to pay rent for that month. And uh, you know they were unanimous or unanimous. Uh, sorry, anonymous. <laughs> and um, you know I just those those kinds of things. Like I said, it wasn't just the money; it was. That, that God saw us. And so as, as he talked about in his general conference address, we often won't really know. You know, the, wh whoever provided that money, I don't think they'll ever know exactly what it meant to us. That it wasn't, again, just about the money. It was, it was, it was grasping in the dark, hoping that, that God saw us and cared for us. And that was an answer to, to a very desperate prayer during, during that period of time. I went online and I looked up, well, how much money does a church donate? And in 2022, a Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Latter Saints, sorry folks, expended $1.02 billion to help those in need according to the Caring for Those in Need report. Members fast for one day each month and generously donate the value of those missed meals to benefit others in need. Now, folks, I don't know what $1.02 billion looks like. But, um, you know, and I, I'm trying not to be prideful here, but I have to admit that I get pretty, pretty frustrated when people are saying things like, oh, there goes another temple, going, it's going to go up. You, you know what you could have done with that money or, you know, in that one fund, how much money there is and and they're so greedy and everything. I mean, folks, one over one billion dollars, that doesn't even count money that members of the church gave that wasn't accounted for in this report. And it doesn't consider the time that a lot of members freely gave. So, uh, you know, big, big thank you to everyone for for your service. And uh, what what a, a great thing, too, about the church that we know that the money that we donate is, you know, if we if we donate it from fast offerings, we know that it's going to go help people. A lot of 
a lot of quote unquote charitable organizations are really about helping themselves and taking money off of the top, you know, 30, 40, 50 percent only goes to helping those in need. But we could we could be assured that what we provide to the church through our fast offerings will go to those who need it. There's also a, a quote that was given in this general conference address from President Nelson, or he was quoting President Nelson, that when we love God with all our hearts, he turns our hearts to the well-being of others. And I, I think about, um, you know, Enos in the book of Enos, and he was, he was um, out hunting, and then he's praying all day and all night, and uh, he's, he's praying for himself, and he receives this great feeling and love of God, and then he prays for the Nephites, and then he prays for the Lamanites. And, um, you know, I think, I think um, one way to, if we're at that place where we're struggling and we're, we're saying, not, not, only, not only does the love of God help us to help others, but I think we could reverse that and say that when we serve others, we're more likely to feel the love of God. Kind of going back to the lesson about spiritual face blindness, as we talked about in an earlier lesson. In his closing, the elder said, May we be forever looking to the well-being of others and show in word and deed that, you know, it's not just, well, we feel your pain. It's showing in word and deed that we are willing to bear one another's burdens, to bind up the brokenhearted, and to keep Christ's second great commandment to love thy neighbor. And I'm really grateful again for this lesson. I hope that you enjoyed it, and I will see you next time. Take care. Bye-bye.